Socialism is a Humanism by Leopold Senghor. Leopold Sadar Senghor, President of the Republic of Senegal, an architect of Senegalese independence, and a leader of the Party of African Federation and the Senegalese Progressive Union, helped to found the Africa and Malagasy Union and the later and larger grouping of pro-Western African nations in the Monrovia bloc. He is the author of five volumes of poetry and edited the anthology De la Nouvelle Poésie Negre et Malgache et de Langue Francaise and of On African Socialism. A lot of French in there that I couldn't say. In the respective programs of our former parties, all of us used to proclaim our attachment to socialism. This was a good thing, but it was not enough. Most of the time we were satisfied with stereotyped formulas and vague aspirations that we called scientific socialism, as if socialism did not mean a return to original sources. Above all, we need to make an effort to rethink the basic text in the light of Negro African realities. Let us first consider the main question. The anti-federalists have accused us of being atheists, Marxists, and of outlawing religion. Surely this smacks of propaganda. Can we integrate Negro African cultural values, especially religious values, into socialism? We must answer the question once and for all with an unequivocal yes. We are not Marxists in the sense given the word today, in so far as Marxism is presented as atheistic metaphysics, a total and totalitarian view of the world, a Weltanschauung. Marx himself once said, as, quote, as for me, I am not a Marxist, end quote. We are socialists. In other words, we shall exclude neither Marx nor Engels from our sources. We shall start from their works as from those of the utopian socialists. And we shall add to these sources the works of their successors and commentators. But we shall retain only the method and the ideas. The method to help us to analyze our situation. The ideas to help us to solve our problems. We shall start from Marx and Engels. Whatever their limitations, their inadequacies, or their errors, they more than all others revolutionized the political and economic thought of the 19th century. The consequences of that revolution are still perceptible in the 20th. Churchmen themselves cannot deny Marx's contributions, and they accept his positive values. And since the liberation... They have perhaps contributed most to an understanding of Marx, in France at least. As proof of this, I need cite only two French Marxists. A final paradox, writes Henri Lefebvre, the master Marxist in France, is that, quote, the most important works on Marxism published recently are signed by Jesuits, end quote. And Lucien Goldman, speaking of the same volumes, notes that they, quote, constitute the, at the moment the principal French contribution to the study of Marxism, end quote. I may particularly draw your attention to Father Bigot's book entitled Marxism et Humanisme. Marxisme et Humanisme. I guess that's Marxism and Humanism in French. It bears the same title that I gave to an earlier article of my own published in Le Vieux Socialiste. We shall take Marx's ideas, theory, and theories as a starting point. Marx borrows economic concepts and vocabulary from his predecessors. To be sure, Marx is interested in statistics, which were then in limbo, but Marx cites facts and figures without verifying or criticizing them. What interests him more than things themselves is man's relationship with other men and with things. He's the real founder of sociology, a 
According to a famous expression, Marx's goal is, quote, to penetrate the real and intimate totality of the relationship of production in bourgeois society, end quote. The fact is that Marx came to economics through philosophy, detouring through Hegel, from whom he borrowed the theory of alienation, and Feuerbach, who taught him the importance of praxis. Marx's sociology is based on the general theory of alienation, which he develops through the particular theories of value and capital. I shall take the latter as my point of departure. For Marx, a commodity is the elementary form of wealth in capitalist-type societies, and every commodity has two values, a use value and an exchange value. The use value of an object is based on human needs. It is, quote, limited by the physical properties of the commodity and has no existence apart from that commodity, end quote. It is the material support of the exchange value. In a capitalist economy, that is, in a money market economy, the exchange value is substituted for the use value and becomes the value in itself. And, quote, the market of the value of any article, oh, excuse me, in a capitalist economy, that is, in a money market economy, the exchange value is substituted for the use value and becomes the value in itself. And the, quote, and, quote, the magnitude of value of any article is the amount of labor socially necessary or the labor time socially necessary for its production, end quote. This is the labor theory of value. In other words, within a patriarchal community economy, commodities born of human needs remain in the hands of men. In a market economy, these same commodities escape from the conscious determination of men, are subject to the monetary law of exchange, and establish objective relations among themselves. The world of things is substituted for the world of men, and dominates the world of men. Men are cut off from nature and from each other. Men have entered the world of capital. Capital could not be identified with the means of production themselves. The means of production themselves existed just as well in the patriarchal, patriarchal community. Capital is the means of production monopolized by a monopoly minority of men. For Marx, capital is even more than that. Capital is an idea that takes life and is personified, a conscious and implacable will that becomes incarnate in a monstrous force. Capital is money whose final objective is to make money. The objective is not to satisfy human needs, not even animal needs, food, clothing, shelter, but rather to grab the surplus value of the worker's labor. It is here that the theory of surplus value intervenes. The value of a commodity is here determined by the amount of labor needed to produce it. This value should normally correspond to the number of hours needed to make this commodity. In a human economy, it should correspond to the number of hours necessary to assure the livelihood of the worker and the worker's family, his material and spiritual life. Let us suppose that this, this number of hours is five. The capitalist ought to pay the worker on the basis of five hours. However, though he pays him on this basis, he makes him work eight hours. But the value of the three extra hours goes to the employer and not to the worker. It is this surplus value that, according to Marx, permits the, quote, accumulation of capital, capitalization. The employer could object that he has taken the risk and provided the means of production. The socialist replies that the investment is amortized after a few years, whereas the surplus value remains indefinitely. But this is perhaps not the essential argument. Marx's general theory is a macroeconomic theory. What he is considering is the totality of workers and the totality of capitalists, 
which eliminates the idea of risk. In the light of these analyses, we can now explain the general theory of alienation that underlies them. The theory of alienation is not precisely discussed in Capital, but rather in the philosophical works of Marx, as well as in a posthumously published manuscript called, quote, Alienated Labor. Without these early works of Marx, it would be difficult to understand Capital. For Marx, Man is essentially a producing artist. This is what distinguishes man from the animal. Both men and animals are placed in nature. Better still, both are products of nature, geography and history, and realize their potential only in and through nature, which is given to us at the outset as an inorganic objective world. The animal does not transform nature. The animal naturally extracts from nature his, quote, immediate means of subsistence in the same sense that he is moved by his instinct. He does not aim beyond the satisfaction of his material needs. If, on the other hand, man realizes himself in nature, he does even more through, he does so even more through, uh, <laughs> if on the other hand, man realizes himself in nature. He realizes himself in nature even more through nature. Marx does not, Jesus Christ, man does not passively submit to the productive forces of nature. He acts on them. Animals produce, quote, Animals produce only under the compulsion of direct physical needs, while man produces when he is free from physical need and only truly produces in freedom from such physical need. Animals construct only in accordance with the standards and needs of the species to which they belong. While man knows how to produce in accordance with the standards of every species, and knows how to apply the appropriate standard to the object. Thus man constructs also in accordance with the laws of beauty, end quote. I'm going to assume that's Marx, because he also would be at this moment. <laughs> man realizes himself as man only by realizing nature, by transforming nature to his measure, and by becoming a creator of culture, of civilization. Man, then, has rights over his activity as a conscious producer, over his, quote, expenditure of labor, and over the objects he produces. In the capitalistic system, however, man undergoes a double alienation, a dual frustration, from the fact that he sells to the capitalist his, quote, labor power, which is the source of all human good. The product of his labor is snatched from the producer in the form of surplus value to increase the capital. Quote, so much does the performance of work appear as a vitiation that the worker is vitiated to the point of starvation. End quote. Marx. The alienation is not only in the product, the alienation is in production itself. By its human character, should be free. Hmm. The alienation is not only in the product, it is in production itself, which by production's human character should be free activity. In the capitalist system, production is imposed on the producer from the outside. Quote, it is forced labor, end quote. It is not the satisfaction of an inner need for creation, quote, but a means to satisfy needs external to man, end quote. Quote, it is the personal, physical, and mental energy of the worker, the worker's personal life, for what is life but activity, as an activity which is directed against himself, 
independent of him, and not belonging to him. This is the self-alienation as against the alienation of the thing. End quote, Marx. Alienated from himself, the salaried producer becomes a stranger to other men behind a screen of objective products. Passively, he is dominated by his products, actively by his employer, to whom the products belong. Man has become a wolf to man. Dude, that's a good-ass line. I like that a lot. Man has become a wolf to man. Let me say that again. Man has become a wolf to man. Am I the only person who thinks that's beautiful? The beautifully uh, succinct description of domination? But the alienation in turn affects the employer, who betrays his human nature. The employer becomes more and more a parasite, leaving to the technician the role of thinker and inspirer that he himself should play. Thus, the employer destroys the natural harmony of persons and things. How can one prevent this mutual alienation and mutatus mutandus? regain the natural equilibrium of a patriarchal economy. Here we refer especially to Engels, who is often clearer than Marx, though less profound. Before the establishment of capitalism, the productive forces, that is to say the instruments of production, were weak. The instruments of production belong either to the individual or to the family in the framework of family cooperation. Little by little, the factory replaced the individual tools. The work, once individual or cooperative, becomes collective, while the productive forces and the products remain individual and private property is maintained. This is the imbalance that breaks natural laws and alienates at once both worker and employer. The alienation of the bourgeois lulls him to sleep instead of waking him. But the proletariat, on the contrary, more seriously alienated, is conscious of his physical and moral suffering. Whence class antagonism, which the accumulation of capital and periodic depressions exacerbate and which calls for a revolutionary solution. Inevitably, the proletariat will one day seize political power and establish its, quote, dictatorship. Quote, in reality, Marx writes, it is up to the practical materialists to revolutionize the existing world, to attack in a practical manner and to change conditions, end quote. Marx. It is a matter of restoring to the productive forces and the products themselves their natural appropriation, which under a system of collective labor can only be collective. Thus the natural balance will be restored. Man will stop being dominated by man's products and will dominate his products. He will institute a planned, rational organization of production. Only thus will he act on nature instead of being acted on by nature. When the totality of goods produced by men, according to each man's capacity, will go to the totality of men according to each man's needs, and man will find his place and his role in the universe, the reign of freedom will then succeed that of necessity. We have been able to present merely an outline of Marxian thought. This is difficult to condense into a few pages, for it is much richer and contains many more nuances than, quote, Marxists usually claim. Sometimes it may even seem contradictory. Let us now examine it with a critical eye. 
We may wonder, first of all, whether the, so the socialism and economics of Marx is really, quote, scientific. Yes and no. No, if one means by scientific, the exact knowledge and formulation of economic facts and laws that permit one to foresee and to organize a balanced economy. Yes, if science is defined as comprehension of the real, if it consists of deciphering the complexities basic to economic facts, and especially man's relation to these facts, and if its aim is to reveal, quote, the economic law of motion in modern society, end quote. So we must not seek in Marx, not even in capital, an expose of economic laws, considering them more or less as contingent, quote, appearances. Marx was not interested in them. Moreover, he went so far as to predict changes that have not occurred. In Conflict de Cecile, I don't know, Conflict de Cecile, I don't know how to speak French. Fritz Sternberg has analyzed almost all the changes in economic, social, and political reality that have taken place since the publication of Capital. They have been listed by other writers. The changes are important, but in our resume of Marx's theories, we skipped over most of them. We shall now mention only a few, while noting the recent studies made in France by the Autonomous Socialist Party. 1. The, quote, class struggle is much more complex than Marx thought. In fact, the working class is not a simple reality. Moreover, the working class is diminishing, while several categories of salaried workers with dissimilar interests are increasing. The peasants, who Marx considered more or less impervious to revolutionary ferment and dedicated to, quote, the stupidity of rural life, end quote, have in underdeveloped countries belied his judgment. And three, the theory of capitalist concentration has not been borne out by the facts. On the contrary, the number of small and medium businesses continue to grow in Western European countries. Four, though periodic economic crises have not ceased, they are becoming rarer. And we cannot reasonably foresee a general cataclysm ending the capitalist system, which is adjusting to economic and social evolution. Five, quote, socialism has not triumphed in the industrial nations of Western Europe, as Marx predicted it would, but in the underdeveloped nations of Eastern Europe and Asia. By excessive simplification of this class struggle theory, a more precise translation of class and comp would be, quote, class war. Marx overestimated the role of the determinism of things and underestimated man's freedom and the organizing power of the capitalist state. Thanks to trade union activity and a more enlightened middle class, the capitalist state has been able, by a policy of intervention and rational organization, progressively to reduce the surplus value. This surplus value, reduced by more equitable taxation, has permitted the productive investments of the post-war era and the institution of social security. Marx welcomed social legislation. In his opinion, social legislation would lead to increased unemployment, bitter class antagonism, and finally to the revolution. However, social reforms have produced quite the opposite effect. We may also observe in passing that Marx did not pay enough attention to the role of cooperatives as preached by the utopian socialists. We know from the Scandinavian socialist democracies that these have proved their worth. In Western labor unions, a will to reform has replaced a will to revolt. In the communist countries, the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, contrary to the teaching of Marx, has made the state an omnipotent, soulless monster, stifling the natural freedoms of the human being and drawing up the sources of art without which life is not worth living. One final word on this point. In Marx's day, colonialism was just beginning. Marx could not have foresee 
colonialism's universal development during the second half of the 19th century. He spoke, of course, of the, quote, modern theory of colonization, but merely in the etymological sense of the word. He had in mind only the European colonization of the United States. Furthermore, his macroeconomic theory and almost blind confidence and proletarian generosity and conscience prevented him from anticipating the opposition that would develop between colonizers from the dominant countries and proletarians in the dominated territories. It is now a commonplace fact that European mass's standard of living has been able to rise only at the expense of the standard of living of the masses in Asia and Africa. The economy of European nations consists fundamentally in selling manufactured products to underdeveloped countries at high prices and buying raw material from the underdeveloped countries at the lowest possible cost. I am not talking about the United States of America. The problem is different with France, but if the prices paid for raw materials in African countries are subsidized, it is no less true that French prices are generally the highest in Europe. One compensates for the other. In a word, the European proletariat has profited from the colonial system. Therefore, it has never really, I mean effectively, opposed it. There, have, there, we have, there we have a series of facts we must think about. We men from underdeveloped countries, men inspired by socialism. We must not consider Marx as an economist like Keynes, but as a sociologist, a philosopher. This would have astonished the founder of, quote, scientific socialism, since he refrained from, quote, philosophizing. Yet his thought remains that of a philosopher. Beyond the economic appearances, it plunges into the human reality that causes them. For the factual view of things, Marx substitutes a profound insight into human needs. He is a new humanism. He is a new humanism, new because it is incarnate. Humanism, the philosophy of humanism, rather than economics, is the basic character and positive contribution of Marxian thought. As we said earlier, Marx does not formulate laws from economic facts. Marx defines the, quote, economic law of motion of modern society, end quote, which is a social, quote, tendency rather than a law. In Marx's analysis, he advanced by postulates and theories that explain the facts. For a better understanding of the philosophy of humanism, we should like to return to the Marxian concept of labor. Here we should add to the extracts from, quote, alienated labor, a passage from Capital, one of the most beautiful and profound that Marx ever wrote. If labor defines man, primitive man is only homo faber, scarcely distinguishable from the animal. His labor is an assimilation of nature, a transformation of nature to satisfy his vital needs, just as his animal, just as his animal activity. To the extent that he acts on nature and humanizes nature, man acts, quote, on his own nature and humanizes it at the same time. Homo faber becomes homo sapiens. He introduces, quote, consciousness and liberty, end quote, as well as artistic feeling into his labor. In doing so, he distinguishes himself from the animal, quote, but what from the very first distinguishes the most incompetent architect from the best of bees is that the architect has built a cell in his head before he has constructed that cell in wax. The labor process ends in the creation of something which when the process began already existed in an ideal form. What happens is not merely that the worker brings about a change of form in natural objects, at the same time, in the nature that exists apart from himself, excuse me, what happens is not merely that the worker brings about a change of form in natural objects. At the same time, in the nature that exists apart from himself, he realizes his own purpose, the purpose which gives the law to his activities, the purpose to which he has to subordinate his own will. 
nor is this subordination a momentary act. Apart from the exertion of his bodily organs, his purpose of will, manifesting itself as attention, must be operative throughout the whole duration of the labor. End quote. Marx. Thus, if labor defines man, a certain kind of labor makes man more than a man. Man realizes his full potential to the extent that there is division and socialization of labor. From patriarchal cooperation to the factory, man grows gradually in consciousness and in freedom. From master of a tool, he becomes master of the world. But at the same time, he is separated from the world and from himself. Grandeur and wretchedness of man in and because of labor. Marx's originality is that starting from purely materialistic postulates, Marx arrives at a vision of man that yields neither in truth nor in death to that of the greatest philosophers. It recalls the vision of Pascal. This is Marx's positive contribution an incarnate conception of man based on the material and social determinations of man. This conception goes further than is generally recognized. In this connection, we refer you to an article by Lucien Goldman, La Reification. Goldman tells us that he borrowed the term from Georg Lukács, Reification appears in the Marxian analysis of value. In capitalist society, mercantile relations gradually replace human relations. Consciousness tends in consciousness's forms of thought and feeling to empty itself from the inside. Its manifestations, religious... Hmm, consciousness... This is consciousness's manifestations, religion, ethics, art, and literature lose their real autonomous character as they are invaded by the, quote, ghostly realities, end quote, of the economy. Homo sapiens become homo econo economicus and regresses to the status of the animal. Quote, the mercantile economy and especially capitalist economy, tends in the producer's consciousness to replace use values with the exchange value. Excuse me. Jesus Christ. Reading too long. Quote, the mercantile economy, and especially capitalist economy, tends in the producer's consciousness to replace use value with exchange value, and concrete significant human relations with abstract universal relations between sellers and buyers. Thus, it tends to substitute the quantitative for the qualitative th throughout human life. I think that's Lucy and Goldman. Although Goldman's thought is shaded, we cannot fully accept his statement that, quote, in classical capitalist society, only the proletariat is in a situation that allows it to refuse reification and to restore its true human character to all the spiritual problems. As Marx, end quote, as Marx has shown us, the proletarian is in fact a victim of the greatest alienation. That is why he avoids labor and takes refuge in the satisfaction of animal needs. His sole superiority over the bourgeois is that he feels his estrangement. If historically he refused this alienation, it was always because of the initiative of less alienated bourgeois intellectuals who showed him the road to liberation. It is true that every worker who reflects about problems is already an intellectual. So it is with colonized people who are the victims of a multiple alienation. 
The intellectuals, often European intellectuals, have awakened them and made them discover their spiritual human riches. In truth, and this follows from Marxian analysis, all Western civilization, all machine civilization, all factory civilization is reified. We shall see what role the colonized peoples must play in the struggle for de-reification. Along with its positive revolutionary contributions, however, Marxist humanism presents a negative aspect. Its weakness is that it proceeds from a one-sided conception of man and universe, or perhaps more exactly from an equivocal conception. Marx's ambition and his paradox has always been to express, throughout his entire work, the dignity of man and his spiritual needs without ever resorting to metaphysics or ethics or religion, not even philosophy. He is a philosopher in spite of himself. Moreover, one needs only to reread Marx carefully to perceive that this vocabulary, his vocabulary in his numerous lyrical passages is one of indignation because it is based on an ethic. In the name of whom or what, after all, does Marx dare to affirm the dignity of man and man's rights to appropriate all the products of his labor? In the name of whom or of what does he condemn night labor, child labor, the African slave trade, unless it be in the name of a certain quality or a transcendent, transcendent something beyond man? Science notes facts and their relations. Science explains. Science does not demand. Science cannot pass from a factual to a value judgment. We do not underestimate the strength of the arguments advanced by Lucien Goldman in his article Propos Dialectique, subtitled blah blah blah, something French. Learn, leaning on Max Adler and Georg Lukács, Goldman shows that Marxism is a sociology. It wants historical knowledge and action theory and praxis, science and ethics. Quote, the dialectical position of Lukács is specifically characterized by the refusal to subordinate the means to the end. The end to the means, the group to the individual, or the individual to the group, etc. End means group, individual, party, masses, etc., being in dialectical thinking elements constituting a dynamic totality within which it is a question of combating in each concrete situation the ever-present ever danger of the primacy of one or another of these with relationship to the others and to the ensemble. End quote. Lucien Goldman. We agree with Goldman that Lukács' position restores the, quote, true inner coherence, end quote, in Marx's work. We do not feel that it eliminates, quote, the so-called dualities, end quote. At this point, we must apply to Marx the Marxian method, the historical method. His life and works reveal him to be primarily a philosopher, a pupil of Hegel and Feuerbach. Later in Paris, he studied, quote, economics, the history of the revolution and socialism, the great thinker Saint Simon exerted the most considerable influence on him. End quote. I don't know who that quote's from. From the French idealistic sociologist, later termed, quote, utopian, Marx inherited his concern for ethics. Marx assimilated, in the etymological sense of the word, German philosophy and French ethics while transforming them so that they appear in these fine threads in his writing, especially in Capital. As he advanced in his career, Marx gradually placed more and more stress on materialism, means and praxis, 
while the philosophical thought and ethical concerns of his earlier work were turned down. But although de-emphasized and hidden, they did not disappear entirely. At the risk of becoming repetitious, we may say that they subtend Marx's writings. One can detect in Marx more than a philosophy and an ethic, a metaphysics, a Weltanschauung, but, broke, but brought back from God to man, from the transcendent to the imminent. Father Bigo is right to speak of the, quote, ambivalence of Marx. In a, review, in a review of Capital, published in the Stuttgart Observer on December 27, 1867, Engels put it even more clearly. Quote, Insofar as the book itself is concerned, we must carefully distinguish between the solid positive presentations and the suggestive conclusions that the author draws from the positive presentations. End quote. Later on, Engels explained, quote, It is quite different with the author's subjective conclusions, the manner in which he imagines and presents to others the ultimate result of the present movement of social evolution. This has nothing to do with what we call the positive part of the book. Moreover, if space permitted us to discuss the point, we could perhaps indicate that those subjective whims are refuted by his own objective expositions, end quote. Engels. This comment by Marx's most, most faithful collaborator, indeed co-author, is not negligible. We need say no more about it. In Marx's work, there is a positive contribution and a subjective tendency that contradicts it and reaches debatable conclusions. We need not reject the same conclusions that Engels rejects. Marx's atheism is, in our opinion, the fruit of this subjective tendency. And yet atheism is deep in Marx. It impregnates his entire work, above all the philosophical writings. It is basic to him. For Marx, the most complete alienation of man stems from religion, because religion separates man from nature, from society, and from himself in order to enclose man in an abstract world where he cannot realize his potential. In Marx's view, the religious act is the most absolute act of dehumanization. To support this contention, we could quote numerous passages. I shall cite only the famous sentence, quote, Religion is the opium of the masses, end quote. Nevertheless, appearances to the contrary, atheism is not necessary to the, quote, positive part of Marx's work. In some of his writings, he even goes so far as to refuse its mediation. Historically, Marx's atheism can be explained both by his family environment and by reasons of praxis. His father was a Jew who had been compelled to embrace Christianity. Thus, young Marx never knew anything but the external practices of religion. He never lived religion. Another historical fact is that the triumph of capitalism in Christian countries of the West was accompanied by serious religious deviations. Marx's atheism can be considered as a reaction of Christian origin against the historical deviations of Christianity, which violated the essence of religion, all the less because the idea of alienation was of religious origin. Translated by Mercer Cook.